So far in this series, without shifting our focus from the book of Genesis, we've seen several passages where the Lord speaks in the plural, like Genesis 1.26, 3.22, and 11.7, all of which point to the inter-Trinitarian counsel and activity of the triune God. We've also looked at Genesis 19.24, where two persons, both identified as Yahweh, are accredited with bringing divine judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah. As far as the teaching of Genesis, not to mention the rest of the Old Testament, this is only the beginning. Another place where Genesis points to personal plurality in the Godhead is found in Genesis 35, verses 1 through 7. In fact, this portion of Scripture points to a whole host of other passages in Genesis that further demonstrate just how entrenched the idea of personal plurality in the Godhead is from the very outset of the Bible. In Genesis 35, 1, it says, Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and live there, and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. In this passage, God speaks of an earlier occasion in the life of Jacob recorded in Genesis 28, where God appeared to him. Inasmuch as God is the speaker in 35.1 and speaks about God in the third person as though he were another person distinct from himself, this passage serves as another indication of personal plurality in the Godhead. The distinction in view here is reinforced or accentuated later in the same context. In 35.6-7 it says, So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. He built an altar there and called the place El Bethel because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. What the English text doesn't clearly convey is that the word for revealed, Niglu, in Genesis 35-7, in reference to God, is actually a third person plural form of the verb Nigla. In other words, when it says that God was revealed to Jacob at Bethel, it literally means they revealed themselves to him. This is similar to the Hebrew of Genesis 20.13, where Abraham, in reference to God calling him out of Ur of the Chaldees, said, God caused me to wander from my father's house. Here, the Hebrew word for caused to wander is hitu, a plural form of the verb ta'ah. It literally means they caused to wander, they referring to God. So a context where God begins by speaking about God, 35.1, also refers to God in the plural, 35.7. When we survey what Genesis says about the manner of God's revelation to Jacob at Luz earlier in Genesis, it becomes readily apparent why God, when referring back to that event in Genesis 35.1, speaks in the third person about God appearing to Jacob, and also why 35.7 speaks of it as a revelation of God in the plural. According to Genesis 28, 10-12, God appeared to Jacob in a dream, standing atop a ladder that reached from heaven to earth. In verse 13, the Lord identified himself to Jacob as the God of his fathers, Abraham and Isaac. He then proceeded in verses 14 and 15 to make several promises to Jacob, including the promise to be with him wherever he sojourns, and ultimately to bring him back to the land of Canaan. In response to this, 28, 16 through 22 reads, Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on its top. He called the name of that place Bethel. However, previously the name of the city had been Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear, and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. This stone, which I have set up as a pillar, will be God's house, and of all that you give me I will surely give a tenth to you. Several times, Genesis 28 says it was the Lord, or God, that Jacob encountered in his dream. And because it was God who appeared to Jacob in Luz, Jacob made a vow to serve God, and renamed the place Bethel, which means the house of God. The significance of this emerges three chapters later, when Jacob has another dream. In Genesis 31:11, it says, 
Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, here I am. In this passage, the speaker is identified as the angel of God. However, in verse 13, the angel of God goes on to identify himself in this way. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar, where you made a vow to me. Now arise, leave this land, and return to the land of your birth. Because many people don't know how the word angel is used in the Bible, the identification of the angel of God as the God of Bethel and the significance of it is easily missed. In Hebrew, the denotative meaning of the word angel, melach, simply means messenger. By itself, the word melach has no ontological significance. That is, it does not indicate what kind of being is in view. This is why the word in Hebrew can be and is used for human beings, heavenly spirits, and even for God. Any person or being who appears and speaks can be referred to as a melach or angel. This fact is clearly stated in every standard reference work on the Hebrew language, from the lexicon of Gesenius to Brown, Driver, and Briggs. In fact, the word is only used for what we ordinarily think of as angels, the heavenly host, 17% of the time. 50% of the time the word refers to human messengers. The remaining 33% refer neither to men nor to the heavenly host, but to the specific figure known as the angel of the Lord or the angel of God. Whenever this full title is used, the phrase is always definite in Hebrew, pointing to a specific person, and the context always indicates that the angel, angel of the Lord, is God. In fact, as numerous scholarly studies have shown, the word melach carries the connotation of presence or manifestation. And in the case of the angel of the Lord, points to him as a manifestation of God or God's very presence. In other words, it involves what theologians call a theophany, an appearance of God. For example, in his doctoral dissertation on the angel of the Lord, Gunther Junker states, A fairly persuasive case can be made that the word melach in the Old Testament does not mean angel at all, at least not in the modern sense of a distinct creaturely spirit. Instead, the word means only presence or manifestation with the ontological status of the one present contextually determined. But second, and more importantly, a variety of recent literary analyses of the Old Testament have tended to confirm the view that the angel of the Lord is Yahweh, or a narratologically sophisticated and theologically subtle way of speaking about him. This is also why S.A. Meyer, in his contribution to the Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible, wrote, it must be understood that the angel of Yahweh in these perplexing biblical narratives does not behave like any other messenger known in the divine or human realm. Although the term messenger is present, the narrative itself omits the indispensable features of messenger activity and presents instead the activities which one associates with Yahweh or the other gods of the ancient Near East. So the identification of the angel of God as the god of Bethel which is made in Genesis 31.11 and 31.13, is not undermined by the fact that the word angel or melach is used for him. That the angel of the Lord is a divine person is further borne out, in fact, by Genesis 32. In Genesis 32, we're told that a man came to Jacob and wrestled with him until daybreak. The occasion served the purpose of preparing Jacob for his encounter with his estranged brother Esau and also for his great calling as the patriarch and namesake of the nation of Israel. At the conclusion of the contest between Jacob and this man, Jacob realized that he wasn't really a man at all, but God himself appearing in human form. This is why Jacob, toward the conclusion of the narrative, named the place Peniel, which means the face of God. As Genesis 32.20 says, so Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. No doubt, even as Genesis 31 tells us that the God who appeared to Jacob at Bethel in Genesis 28 was the angel of the Lord, so likewise we should understand that the God who appeared to Jacob at Peniel was also the angel of God. In fact, this is not just a good inference, but is explicitly stated by the prophet Hosea. In Hosea 12, verses 3 through 5, 
the prophet says the following about Jacob. In the womb he took his brother by the heel, and in his maturity he contended with God. Yes, he wrestled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. He found him at Bethel, and there he spoke with us, even the Lord, the God of hosts. The Lord is his memorial name. Here, the prophet Hosea identifies the angel as the one who appeared to Jacob at Bethel in Genesis 28, and the one who wrestled with Jacob at Peniel in Genesis 32. Moreover, as in Genesis 31, Hosea explicitly identifies the angel who appeared at Bethel and Peniel as the Lord, the God of hosts. This is why in Genesis 35.1, God speaks about God appearing to Jacob, and also why Genesis 35.7 could say that in and through that event, they revealed themselves to him. The God of the Bible is not a unipersonal being, and the Lord did not wait until the New Testament to make this fact known. From the first book of the Bible to the last, Scripture reveals a plurality of divine persons who speak to and about each other. In the next video, we will see how this fact is further seen in the life of Jacob, and also in the revelation made by God to Jacob's ascendants, the great patriarchs Abraham and Isaac.